Good evening. Welcome to worship this evening. A special welcome to any guests or visitors that we have with us. We also welcome all those who are worshiping with us online and on TV. Today's theme is God's Word Possesses God's Power. After the service, I invite you all to talk about what we learned from God's Word and apply it to your lives. We begin with the opening hymn, hymn number 711, Jesus Calls Us O'er the Tumult. of service is service setting one in the blue hymnal on page 154. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us, cause, let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Amen. 
For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you have prepared joys beyond understanding for those who love you. Pour into our hearts such love for you that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first lesson for this evening comes from 1 Kings chapter 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. Elisha was do, doing the plowing with 12 teams of oxen in front of him, and he himself was driving the 12th team. Elijah crossed over to him and threw his cloak over him. Then Elisha left the oxen and ran after Elijah. He said, let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye. Then I will follow you. Then Elijah said, go back. What have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from following him. Then he took the team of oxen and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen as fuel, he cooked the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. He got up and followed Elijah and served him. The word of the Lord. We continue with the psalm. Psalm 62 found on page 88 in the front part of the red hymnal.
second reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. However bold anyone might be, I'm speaking in a foolish way, I'm going to be bold too. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's seed? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I'm speaking in a crazy way. I am even more. I have done more hard work, been in prisons more often, been whipped far more, and I have been close to death many times. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. One time they tried to stone me to death. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day on the open sea. I have often been on journeys in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, in danger from my own people, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the wilderness, in danger on the sea, in danger among false brothers. I have worked hard and struggled. I have spent many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty. I have gone without food many times. I have been cold and lacked clothing. Besides those external matters, there is the daily pressure on me of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who falls into sin without my being distressed? If it is necessary that I boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The word of the Lord. The Gospel Acclamation. Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Please stand for the gospel. Our gospel lesson for today comes from Luke chapter 9 and will serve as the basis for our sermon. When the days were approaching for him to be taken up, Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of him. They went and entered a Samaritan village to make preparations for him. But the people did not welcome him because he was determined to go to Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. You don't know what kind of spirit is influencing you, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy people's souls, but to save them. Then they went to another village. As they went on the way, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus told him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another man also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say goodbye to those at my home. Jesus told him, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you may be seated. At this time, we ask everyone to fill the white attendance cards that can be found in the pew in front of you. Later on in the service, when the offering baskets are passed, please place those cards in the baskets. Another option is to use a QR code up on the screen or one that's found in the bulletin. For those who are worshiping with us online, you can find a link above or below the video, which will take you to the same form. Thank you for your loving cooperation. We continue with the hymn of the day, hymn number 695, Take My Life and Let It Be.
grace, mercy, and peace are yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what is the cost of being a follower or a disciple of Jesus? Is that something that you've ever really thought about? Of being a Christian, what is the cost of being a Christian? It's a question there that Jesus is having James and John and the other disciples with him, and those three men who come up to him today in our lesson consider to count the cost of being a disciple of him, his. It's because being a Christian is, well, not always easy. There's trials, there's troubles, there's tribulations that come in, and it means, well, we're not to live as part of this world. We're going to need to make sacrifices. We're going to need to... Do, to give things up. So we need, to be, we need to count the cost of being one of Jesus' disciples. In our gospel lesson for today, we find Jesus going on his way to Jerusalem. As it says, his time to be, well, to rise there, to ascend, is coming. He, his time to die on the cross for the sins of the world and yours and mine were coming. So he set his face to Jerusalem. He was making sure he was headed there. But not long before this was the, an amazing event that took place. It was the transfiguration of our Lord. Where Jesus was on that mountain and Elijah and Moses were there speaking with him. And Peter, James, and John were able to see that amazing sight. Give that a glimpse of Jesus' glory. He came down from that mountain and, well, was headed towards it to Jerusalem. And he decided here to go through the region of Samaria. And he sent out messengers to go and say, hey, there's a place that Jesus, the Savior, he's headed to Jerusalem. He needs to stay here. Well, the Samaritans didn't agree with the Jews that Jerusalem was the place to worship. They thought there was another mountain to worship on, and so they rejected Jesus and what he was doing. This made James and John here angry. So angry, what do we see them wanting to do? Wanting to go and call fire down from heaven and end the lives, the time of grace of these Samaritans there in this town. You can see they're full of zeal, full of pride. Probably partially because of what they had just experienced there on that Mount of Transfiguration. They were angry that these people were rejecting Jesus. But perhaps they were a little bit angry that in a way they were rejected too. As being Jesus' disciples, they were facing rejection, you could say persecution there, for being followers of Jesus. Well, Jesus had to show them that, well, their anger for this, even though, yes, we can be frustrated over people not believing, it was misguided because what they were doing was not acting in love for these people, but in anger and frustration, wanting to bring judgment down on them. Really, they were trying to make being a disciple of Jesus what they wanted it to be. They didn't want it to be easy without this persecution, without this struggle that came along with it. Jesus had to point out to them that the fact that he was there was not to go and destroy souls, but to save them, to proclaim that message to them and die for the sins of the whole world so why everyone could go to heaven. It was their time of grace, and Jesus was there to preach them the gospel. Those disciples, James and John there, they, well, needed to count the cost of being a disciple, that you're going to bring a message that, well, people would reject you. It's not always going to be easy. Now, as we look at this lesson before us, we see that beginning section and those three men later on, it might seem like, well, there's a disconnect to them. How are these connected? How do we see them being disciples and having to count the cost? Well, really what it is is, each one of these people, both James and John and those people later on, those men, is, they were attaching, well, criteria. Making stipulations to say, if I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus, I still need to be able to do this, or my life still needs to be in this way. Jesus tells all of them to count the cost. Now, three men that we're getting to next, they were very clearly believers in Jesus. The fact they called Jesus Lord shows that, and, well, they did want to follow Jesus, and they did want to follow after him, but, well, maybe not fully. The heart was still putting other things first, putting different plans in place in front of God's plan there, what he wanted to do. And as we look at it, well, those things that Jesus asked them to do were perhaps quite difficult. This section of scripture is called oftentimes the hard sayings of Jesus. They're hard because, well, maybe we can put ourselves in those places. 
Maybe it seems like Jesus is being hard or harsh, but then we know that, well, if we were in a conversation with this person, we don't know the motivation behind their answer. But Jesus does. Jesus could tell that these men were, well, maybe trying to hold on to things of this world or trying to make things the way they wanted to be, making discipleship something the way they wanted instead of what God wanted and according to his will. So let's go to that first person. The first person Jesus there encountered on the road, Jesus came, or they came to him and said, I will follow you wherever you go. What great enthusiasm. This man came up to Jesus and said, I'm going to follow you. Perhaps we can equate it with James and John there, where they saw that rejection of Jesus and they are willing to call fire down to destroy them, saying, this is how dedicated I am to you, Jesus. Maybe in our minds we can fast forward a little bit to Monday Thursday, where Peter had that same type of zeal. Where he said, Lord, I will not fall away. I will not disown you. Even if everybody else says, I will die for you. And Jesus says, well, before the night is over, you will deny me three times. There's the zeal there, but the wrong motivation that is behind it. This individual here really wasn't counting the cost, wasn't considering of what being a disciple there of Jesus were following around, what it truly means. And Jesus wanted him to stop and think and say, what is the cost of being my disciple? So he says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus was making it clear that all those comforts that you have in this life, your home, your furniture, all these great and wonderful blessings, if you're going to be following me on the road and being my disciple, you're going to have to give up these earthly blessings. There's going to be trials. There's going to be troubles. Things aren't going to be easy all the time. But Jesus was saying that birds and foxes oftentimes have a better idea of where they're going to eat or what they're going to eat or where they're going to sleep than the Son of God does there every day. And we see an example for us today as he's going to those villages, the preparations would be trying to find a place to stay. It's very clear that sometimes Jesus would have to spend the night under the stars without any home or any hotel or inn to stay in, completely exposed to the elements. And this individual wasn't taking that account. He had to count the cost, and, well, when the cost was counted, it wasn't something he could bear. We see many people do that today, too, don't we? Where people want to join a church or be a Christian, but, well, they still want all the good things that go go with being a Christian, but they don't want the trials, the troubles, the tribulations that come along with it. What I mean is they might come with so much zeal, but as soon as there's some pushback, as soon as they see that, well, maybe there's the sin that I like to do, I can't continue to do it, or there's a lifestyle that I'm doing, and, well, the church and God's word says I can't do it, it becomes a burden for them. They can't count the cost, and they want to hang on to those things rather than follow Jesus. Maybe it's a biblical principle that doesn't quite fit with the world around them, and they know that they're going to face persecution for it. Maybe a prime example today is, well, as we saw Roe versus Wade overturned, and holding on to that fact that every life is a life from God, even those lives of a baby, they should be protected, but we see all the pushback around us, it can well, make us try to retract and distance ourselves from God's Word, and try to justify it in our way, some way so that Well, we don't stick out and don't get that pushback from the world around us. Maybe sometimes we try to put conditions on our discipleship too and our following Jesus too. The second man came to Jesus and Jesus went up to him first actually and said, follow me. His response was, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. It's not clear whether this man's father had just died and he needed to go and plan the funeral and get that going. He could also have meant that he needed to stay with his father until eventually months or weeks or years down the line he died. Then he'd be able to follow Jesus. Either way, we know that from Jesus' answer that, well, his answer here wasn't sincere. There was something holding him back from following Jesus here fully. And this may seem like a really harsh request of Jesus. All this man wanted to do was to, well, bury his father. We, we've maybe felt that in our lives as we've lost a loved one too. 
But this request and the other requests here are really no different than any other request that Jesus has had. There's really kind of ordinary for Jesus. It's the same request that Jesus gave to those other disciples, telling them to drop everything and follow him, and they went and did it. See, if some Joe Schmo was telling you to drop everything and follow him, well, that'd be one thing, but when the Son of God himself comes and tells you to drop everything and follow him, well, it's something that we want to do. What this and all the other examples we have for today really come down to is, a, is dealing with the first commandment. First commandment is, you shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. To follow Jesus, to be a believer and disciple of him means you put Jesus and God first over everything. God must come first before everything else, and we want to proclaim his word to everyone. So what this comes down to is, well, a decision of loyalty here. Where does our loyalty stand? Does it stand with God, or do we stand with the things of this earth, with family, with friends, with other things that we just want to keep holding on to, the blessings of this earth, holding on and putting above God? Maybe it's trying to keep the peace between our friends and family by, well, bending God's word a little bit, trying to make it more palatable, palatable for them, and maybe for us too. Or it's perhaps making idols in our lives, putting things in front of God where maybe we just try to do things for ourselves before God. Maybe it's, for instance, going to church where we say, well, I know I need to go to church and I make God in my life a big part of my life, but, you know, I need to make some time for myself too. That needs to come first. Or I need to read my Bible, but, uh, you know, there's all these other things I have to do. This, I've got this list of things to get done. Then, then I'll find some time to squeeze this in here or there. Or I want to volunteer and help at my church, but I've got all these projects that I've got to get done. And, well, once the list gets smaller, then I'll do it. It's interesting, those lists of excuses, things that we can do, continually seem to get bigger. They don't ever get smaller, and so often God gets pushed farther and farther down as we don't make him a priority in our lives. The third person Jesus spoke to, again, it approached him first, and really out of all of them probably has the most zeal as he really doesn't give Jesus a chance to speak. He comes to him and says, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say goodbye to those at my home. Jesus' response was, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. If you know anything about farming, you know the importance about, of getting those rows that you're plowing and you're planting straight. There's many reasons for this. One is so you can maximize the amount of crops you can fit in that field, and you can maximize the growing potential of those crops. So you can better weed and spray them so that, well, those weeds aren't there that are taking away from your harvest. It's so important today that you'll see tractors that can be basically guided by GPS to make sure that they are perfectly straight, getting in, down the road the way they should. It was even more important back then where they didn't have tractors, didn't have all this equipment, but they had a plow that, well, they had to be pulled or pushed to get through the ground. And if they were distracted with other things, looking back, wondering about other things and not paying attention to what they're doing, they may look behind them and see, well, their, their line wasn't straight. They didn't plow straight and they'd have to start all over again. People today so often want to have their foot in both courts. God's court and, well, the court of this world. They think that they could be Christians and still be part of the world and maybe just dip your toes into the devil's water every once in a while. Perhaps you've heard that it's okay to dip your toes in every once in a while. Really what they're trying to do is have two masters, God and the world and their sinful flesh, and it's something that, well, we just can't do. What the devil will eventually do is bring us farther and farther away from God. And what we have an example here before us is one that, well, perhaps the devil works the hardest on is where we have an example of a family here. That perhaps that family didn't like what this man was going to do, that they're going to try to convince him to not go and follow Jesus. We are not 100% sure. But we know that that family relationship and that close friend relationship is one that the devil tries to use to draw a wedge between us and God. 
And what I mean is, is, well, we all love our family members. We all love our friends. And, well, guess what? Those family members and friends are all sinners like you and me. And perhaps we have a family member who, or friend who is caught in a sinful lifestyle or is committing a sin, and it hurts us to, well, maybe call them out on that. Perhaps it's because we don't want them to feel bad, or perhaps we don't want our relationship for them to be broken because we know it's going to start a fight. So what do we try, what does the devil convince us to do? We try telling ourselves, well, it's really okay. It's really okay, it's not a big deal, and start justifying that sin. What often ends up happening is we start looking to them and saying, well, yeah, that's not really a big deal. They're still nice. They're still a wonderful person. It must be God's word that's wrong instead of what this person's doing. We try to have it both ways, and the devil slowly brings us away from God and his word. We see that we need to be fully devoted to God. What makes these sayings really so hard and hit home with each of us is, well, they're really everyday situations, aren't they? As we read through this section, I'm sure it was pulling at your heartstrings to look at this and say, well, yeah, I've got these earthly blessings that I like to hang on to. We've all had somebody who's passed away, and we know the pain that fulfills and having to bury them there. We have those family members around us all the time. We've all been rejected and gone through those hard times there and how much we don't like having that feeling of rejection. It's something that hits home with each and every one of us. So this section forces us to ask the question of what kind of follower am I? Do I put others before God? Do I I put other things before God? Do I put my own wants and needs before God? Do I put conditions on me being a follower and believer in Christ? The question comes then of, well, who can truly be a follower of Christ? Because we know we all fall short. It seems that it's impossible. Well, to answer that question, we have to ask another one. We have to look at what kind of Savior Jesus is. And to find that answer, we can go to verse 51 of our our lesson today, which says, When the days were approaching for him to be taken up, Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. Literally what it says there is he turned his face, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. That he was dead set, literally dead set on going there. Why? He went to Jerusalem to die for your sins and mine. And he counted the cost of what that meant. He went there, set his face to it, knowing that when he came to that city, he'd be rejected there by the people he came to save. He knew that he would be arrested, spit on, beaten, have a false trial put against him, be hung on a cross, and he knew that God himself, his father, would turn his back on him, would forsake him on the cross, and he would suffer hell for you and me. But he went anyway. He counted the cost and was determined to go there to save you and me from our many sins, from all those shortcomings of where we've made idols of things, where we put things before God, where we've counted the cost and we've said, you know what, I'm not going to be a follower. I'm going to go do this and that and the other thing. Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that, well, we might go to heaven with him. You see, he was fully committed to us, committed to save us, And that means our commitment to him means something. You see, when we go and do those things that these people here were doing, these men were doing, where we put these other things first, what we're really looking for is that gratification here on this earth, that fun, that glory here on this earth. And what we need to see is there's something greater. That it's not worthless for us to commit ourselves to Christ because, well, you see, Christ's commitment to us won us that salvation. Won us something greater than any of the blessings that we see in this earth are. He won us heaven so that we'll be with him one day. See, all those things that we put before God are really worthless. Worthless compared to the glories, the salvation, the eternity in heaven. All those things will be destroyed, but in heaven we'll be with our Savior forever in true perfection. Where there will be no more suffering, no more pain. No more loss, no more persecution, but we'll all be in unity, faith and trust in our Lord and Savior, being in his presence 
forever. That gives us motivation. Motivation to commit ourselves to God in our lives, in every part of our lives, in every aspect, in everything that we do. Because he was determined to save us, so we want to be determined to serve him all our days. Yet we know we have sin in this world. We know we fall short. We have that forgiveness of God, but the question might come, well, where do I get this motivation? How do I have the ability to go and do all these things and be this disciple, this believer that God wants me to be? We won't be perfect in this life, but we draw our strength from God and his word to do these things. You see, as Jesus was going through Samaria, what he did, we see that he sent people out before him to prepare prepare for him to come. And part of that was probably, as we see here, they announced why he was going to Jerusalem. They proclaimed that gospel message. And we have that same gospel message. That gospel message that worked into your faith, into your hearts and mind. That gospel message that strengthens and builds our faith. It's that gospel message that appeals to that new person that we have in Christ, that new creation, the creation that wants to go and is able to go and serve God perfectly here on this earth. We want to build that new self up as we feel that battle within ourselves for that new and old self, the part that wants to serve God and the part that well, wants to hang on to this world. Through God's word, through the study of his word, he strengthens that new self to better fight back against those temptations. It makes it much easier for these harsh or these hard words of Jesus to swallow because as we go to that new self, that's where it sees everything in the proper order and the proper light. That puts Christ first above everything else, everything that we do in this world. As we see what Christ has done for us, let us serve him with greater loyalty in the future. Motivated by his love for you and me. And may God help us do so for his name's sake. As we count the cost of being his disciples every day. Amen. Please rise. We continue with confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll collect our offerings of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord and Savior. Please also fill out or place those white attendance cards in the offering plates as they are passed. We love because Christ first loved us. We continue with the offering hymn. Hymn number 836 stands as 1 and 2 and 5 and 6. I walk in danger all the way.
We include in our prayers this morning a prayer for Valerie Wagner and Ed Deals, both of whom have been hospitalized this last week, and also for, for Ed and Karen Deals, who will be celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. You may remain seated for prayer. O oh, Father, though you are exalted over heaven and earth, nevertheless you have mercy and compassion on the lowly. Therefore we come to you confidently with all our needs, trusting you to supply them. We come to you for food, clothing, shelter, good health, steady employment, protection, and all other things that we require. Because we still have a sin, our sinful flesh, we confess that we are in danger of desiring more than is sufficient and striving for things that are not good for us. We therefore leave the final selection of all our earthly blessings to your wisdom and holy will. Forgive our sins, especially forgive all those times when we, your children, complained about our lot in life and forgot your many blessings. Forgive all those times where we were dis dissatisfied and wanted more than was sufficient for us. Forgive all those times we did not share our abundance with those in need. Forgive all those times we neglected to thank and praise your holy name. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. Lead our entire nation to repentance that it may escape your wrath and displeasure. Father, we know that you have forgiven all our sins and supplied all our needs. Therefore, unto you we raise our voices in prayer. And dear Lord, we come to you as our brother and sister in faith, Ed and Valerie, were hospitalized this week and ask you for your deliverance. We hope that it is your will to cut short their trial and make them well again. Grant rest and refreshment for their bodies. Cause their minds to dwell on the message of your suffering and death on the cross. And through it, comfort them with the forgiveness of sins. According to your invitation and promise, we call on, your on you in Jesus' name. And dear Lord, the giver of the sacred gift of marriage, we thank you for the 25 years of marriage which you have blessed Ed and Karen deals. Your love and grace have motivated them to love each other and remain faithful to their vows. Continue to bless them with commitment and love for you and each other. Help us, Lord, to always celebrate such occasions, for they are celebrations of your gifts and the power of your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue with the next hymn, hymn number 909, O Lord our God, your gracious hand.
Please stand for prayer. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join in the prayer our Lord and Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with the closing hymn, hymn number 737, Lord, help us walk your servant way. Great to have you all in worship this evening. Just a couple of announcements. Um, sign up for VBS if you haven't already. We do have the, um, the uh, t-shirt order in, so you're not guaranteed at this point if you haven't signed up to get a excuse me, to get a t-shirt, but we do have a couple of extras. We are still need, um, in a need for teachers for VBS. Um, we have uh, 90 kids signed up at this point, so we've had to split some classes, and it's a little bit bigger than we've had, um, well, since last year and since COVID has gone on. So um, if you're willing to teach, um, please let me know. All the materials are there for you, um, given for you. Uh, the lesson plans are all there. It's well, basically kind of telling a Bible story, so it's not something that's really hard to do. So if you're interested, please talk to myself. For all those volunteering, whether you're teaching or, or helping out in some other way for VBS, uh, on July 10th, that's uh, a Sunday after the 9.30 service, we will have a uh, planning meeting. Well, it's not a planning meeting, kind of a, um, I guess it's planning, but this is how it's going to work kind of meeting. So our material will be handed out, um, and we'll really get things um, down pat, ready to go for the um, for VBS in the coming week. There is an opening for child care and kindergarten assistant positions. You can see the bulletin for more information on that. 
A work day for setting up the fifth grade classroom will be uh, the 29th. Uh, please note the new date for that. It's the 29th. Um, the last week the, we had the wrong date in there, and that'll be from 5 to 8 p.m. There'll be demolition, there'll be painting, there'll be hanging of whiteboards and smartboards. Um, call Ben Schmitz if you can help. Also, tomorrow is the deadline for script to be applied, um, any script funds that um, you would have to be applied for next year's tuition at the school. Um, so tomorrow is the last day. We'll be selling script after the service today if you would like to last minute get some purchases in. Those are all the announcements. We do have the Wells Connection to view for today. And the Lord bless your week. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Education makes a difference, not just in academic achievement, but also in developing Christian character. A powerful illustration of how education can transform lives is on display at Kingdom Prep, a new Wells Area Lutheran High School in Milwaukee. How are you? Can't complain. <laughs> When we got started, it's hard as a new school coming into a space and just saying, okay, make us number one on your list, right? It started off with eighth grade young men coming to build a high school. And so these eighth grade young men came to Wednesday night founders groups and they started designing one at a time, uh, the mascot, the school day, what we would wear, uh, where we would go on Exploration Thursday trips. How do we create a space to be able to continue to serve kids from the city? How do we make uh, young men who are ready to be men of the kingdom. Anybody else got something that they want to say from what Mr. Spurrier was talking about when he was last up here? Cam, what you got for me? Loud and proud. We now have about 200 young men, and you now have these originally eighth graders. They're now the seniors who've gotten much bigger, much stronger, uh, much more biblically centered, and they are now raising up the next generation of freshmen who will come in here next and carry on the legacy. Oh, it's all boys' school. I was already struggling in middle school because, you know, there's females distracting me. All right, I'm going to an all-guys area. Think of it as a football team, and everything runs smoothly. And so when we first uh, came up with the idea of an all-boys school, we like brotherhood. We want to be brothers. We want to be a family. Even with our lunch, we have a family-style lunch where everybody comes to sit down at the table. We have a table captain. You want to work with your family through the hard times, the good times, you know, the bad times. You're always with your family. The next line, lazy hands make for what? Poverty. True? Apostle Paul says, carry each other's burdens, and in so by doing, you fulfill the law of Christ, which is obviously to love one another. The way that we built brotherhood through Christ and God is, like, really important because he's, like, the main building block. He's what we all base ourselves around and, like, being able to talk to other guys about that. It's one of the best parts about the school. I have a group of people that I can talk to about religion or if I'm struggling, they're always there to talk to me. They'll bring up Bible verses or anything like that. Where you're on your game all the time and you keep on missing Bible study because you're on your phone on your game. So whatever hurts my brother hurts me. So if my brother needs help with something, I'm gonna be there to help him out. We're only as strong as our weakest link, right? Uh, we're here to constantly be being able to bend over and pick a brother up. Fixing whatever traumas and things that they've experienced within themselves. Counseling is a big piece around here. And how do we allow them to be able to express themselves? We live in a city where like, there's a lot of bad influences and you're not really able to be yourself. You're not able to be vulnerable. I preach the gospel to them, right? But I'll then I'll give him some practical wisdom in here and say, young man. I was pretty down on the situation I was in. And coming here, it grew my faith with God because as I was in a low place in life, um, I went to God. Your personal mission statement should be timeless. And then the realization of I need my Lord to get me through these tough times. And it helped a lot build my um, faith. Number two, you can find truth for your life by reading God's word. 
because you know everybody has stuff going on at home or things in general and like being able to go to a place where you can feel comfortable and like be vulnerable talk to people without being judged we're preparing young men for leadership uh, for trade school for college for entrepreneurship you name it I plan on going to culinary school. I plan on going to Northwestern Michigan. They have a really good uh, culinary program. I want to help out students. I want to help people get the things that I wasn't able to have. I love to just give back to the future generations, basically. So MLC is a school for teachers. It'll help me keep my faith while I'm still up there. And two, I can still play football. All the things that I've learned, aside from academics, like all the life lessons teachers have taught me, all the good values and principles, I'm bringing that all with me as well. They're starting to recognize what does it mean to live in this kingdom first and foremost. Uh, I think it's going to pay off in big ways. I think they're going to be husbands to their wives, fathers to children, um, community leaders, certainly church, you know, congregational leaders. It's going beyond just getting a diploma. It's beyond just the work that you pour in but how are you intrinsically a better young man? But to be able to do a, a work from my heart and to continue to live towards his glory and everything that I do, like, you can't beat it, man. You can't beat it. Your personal mission statement will help you to maintain your value. I would dare say the first and best thing we have going for us is kingdom first, the word first, right? And after that, everything else kind of falls into place. We're doing this for Christ. And so that's where the kingdom part comes in. You know, we are doing it to serve Christ. So that's what it's all about. Kingdom Prep is four years old which means the first class of students has become the first class of graduates, heading out into the world to serve the kingdom. And overall enrollment at our Wells Lutheran Elementary Schools and area high schools is up 10% this year, a tremendous blessing that means thousands of additional children are hearing about Jesus every day.